in an earlier panel, uh, the Korean War was described as the Forgotten War. Uh, but there's another one that uh, pretty much deserves that name as well. That's the, uh, the Gulf War. It was such a decisive American uh, victory and, and was so short that I think uh, we have lost sight of the uh, incredible job that American armed forces did uh, in vanquishing uh, the huge army uh, that Saddam Hussein had at that time. Uh, one of the greatest American victories um, of all time. Uh, our moderator um, is a participant, was a participant in that effort, Scott Stump, uh, is a Gulf War veteran and is the CEO and president of the uh, National Desert Storm Memorial, which uh, we hope will get built here in Washington, D.C. at the foot of the mall. So please welcome Scott Stump. Distinguished uh, Guests and uh, cadets, I hope that you don't mind me uh, wearing out my welcome here. I know you've heard it a lot over and over again, but I want to thank you for choosing to serve. In our country, it is a choice, and you made that choice, and you're going to be our future leaders, and I'm, I'm very honored to be able to, uh, to stand here before you. You know, has everybody in the room heard about the 1% they talk about in this country? Well, guess what? You're it and probably even a little bit more than that. It's a rarity in, these, in this day and age to serve, and it's something that you will never forget. And I'm always reminded when I go around this country, I've spoken with a lot of veterans from all different eras, and it all boils down to service. And you know what they tell me? They tell me is, you know, Scott, I don't do anything special. Okay, I take care of my family, I work hard, but my military service was at one time in my life where I really felt like I was important. I was a part of something that was bigger than myself. And if you all haven't figured that out yet, you will. You will be a part of that. So thank you so much for, for being here, and I hope that, uh, uh, that we can educate you and enlighten you on, as Jim had mentioned, uh, kind of the modern day forgotten war. And I'm gonna go ahead and dispense with reading the, uh, the bios. You all can read the, the letters yourselves probably a lot better than I can. But I do wanna mention that on, on this stage right now, we have and, uh, 103 and a half years of combined experience. 38 years won, 35 and a half years General Franks. Colonel Ray was 30 years. We have 103 years of combined experience. I'm not even go in, gonna go into all of the medals. I really don't even deserve to be on the same stage as these gentlemen. Uh, Silver Stars, uh, Admiral Arthur was the most decorated aviator in Vietnam. I uh, was in charge of all the naval forces in Operation Desert Storm. Uh, everybody's heard of the left hook. General Franks is a Silver Star recipient himself uh, and was basically the, the driving force of the left hook maneuver that went deep into Iraq and enveloped Kuwait. And last but not least, I have an affinity for uh, Colonel Ray because we both were in the Marine Corps, and he is the most highly decorated uh, veteran of Operation Desert Storm. So these men are men of honor, and as I mentioned, I am just uh, uh, completely um, uh, in awe of them and, and really appreciate them being here today. Uh, I wanted to start off, gentlemen, if I could just ask you all in, a, in no particular order, since we're talking to people that are at the beginning of their careers, I was wondering if you might be able to share with us what inspired you, what motivated you to initially serve. Colonel Ray, would you like to start that? <laughs> I, well, first off, I, I want to be, uh, acknowledge you because you're the most important person here in the in this room, we're uh, we're here to somehow mentor and give you some advice and and uh, hopefully set you on a course for success. But that said, <laughs> I uh, I I made it in my case I made it no it's no secret that when I joined the Marine Corps I never I hadn't given it much thought I just kind of. It was a spontaneous thing. I was actually, I was actually playing football at the University of Washington. I got injured, and I had an, uh, and I, I was looking at a summer where I couldn't practice practice the game that I practiced every summer for the last previous ten years, I guess, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do when, in fact, I was supposed to go back to school. So instead, I was, I'm walking down. Sidewalk in Seattle and uh, ran into a Marine Corps recruiter, and you know the rest is rest is what it is. But <laughs> so so 
in my particular case, and I, and I always want to share this, is make sure I never really had a plan for a career. All I ever wanted to do was what was needed. And, and I dressed any time there was a, uh, a mission or something somebody really didn't want to do, I'd just I'd kind of pony up and do that. I figured, I, I figured if I did something nobody else wanted to do, nobody would bother me. And I could do it my way. And, uh, and I'm, I'll just tell it that. And, that, and so that's how it kind of worked for me. And so I'll be frank about it. There's some value in looking back. Because anytime you do what, what the job that needs to be done, it's really appreciated. And the second thing is that in most cases, when you're doing what needs to be done, it's what America needs also. So, so kind of keep that, always keep that in, uh, in the back of your mind. Hey, sometimes, uh, sometimes the morally right thing is the professionally scary thing. And uh, you gotta, you're just going to have to do the morally, in my opinion, I think it's to do the morally right thing is the right thing to do. And, and, and sometimes it's, uh, it doesn't feel like the right thing right away because it's a little scary and might get a little, uh, somebody might look at you. Look, look at you hard, but in the long run, you 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 can respect yourself. You'll know in the long run, you you'll be right. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, General. Well, thanks for asking, and and again, I'm, what what Eddie just said about your own commitment to serve. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. You don't have to do this. You don't have to even be here today, but you are, and you made that commitment. And soon you will raise your right hands and take the oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. So thanks, thanks for that. That's huge. And our land, sea, and air forces will be in your great and capable hands in the future in a world uh, I, I think it much more complex to to apply military force in than, than perhaps uh, we dealt with. For my own case, my wife and I uh, grew up in a small town west of Reading, Pennsylvania, about 180 miles, 150 miles uh, due north of here. Uh, we grew up around World War II veterans what we came to know as the greatest generation. And I guess what impressed me most about them was their <coughs> selflessness, their truly unselfish nature about what they had gone and done as part of a whole team here in the United States of America and as part of our forces around the world to, to save, our, save our world and save our country. And I members of my own family I knew and were, were gone and served. So I wanted to go earn the right to lead people like that. It's as simple as that. And later, when I was wounded in, in Vietnam and was at the Valley Forge General Hospital in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, and a lot going on about the Vietnam War, and I was a major at the time, and the fellow soldiers there were looking to me to try to explain to them why were all these insults going on about their own service. Didn't service matter? Didn't, didn't go on and defending your country matter? Didn't going and doing what your country asked matter? Didn't courage matter? And of course, all that is true. Yes, it does. And it did. But I really had no answer. And so I could have I guess retired on a medical disability and, and looked around and decided I didn't want to be anything other than a soldier. And what I wanted to do for the rest of my own life, the hot blue flame inside of me personally, was to do within my own circles a responsibility to see to it that that trust was never fractured again and to do what I could to help those following and follow on generations to be 
be able to fulfill that trust. And so that's why I began, and, and that's why I was <coughs> privileged and honored to be able to continue to serve, which for me was life's great privilege. Thanks. Well, again, let me uh, echo what's already been said, uh, our appreciation for you signing on the dotted line. It's very important. I don't think you'll regret it. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to be born into a family where my dad had enlisted in the Navy when he was 17 years old. And so I was born out in San Diego to a petty officer second class machinist mate serving on one of the destroyers out there in the harbor. Uh, my earliest recollection, recollections of Navy was the Lexington and the Saratoga pulling into San Diego, their home port. The old F-4B-4 by wings with the yellow wings and the red stripes on them flying around North Island. Uh, and there was a lieutenant that lived on the street behind us uh, that was one of the pilots. And I said, boy, that's, that's what I want to do. Uh, we go through the Second World War years. We've traveled around. Dad's gone most of the time. We finally settled back in the little hometown in Jackson, Ohio, small farm community. And uh, senior year, football season's over, and I'm restless. School's very dull. And uh, I come home one day and tell Dad, well, <clears throat> I'm off to see the recruiter tomorrow. I'm joining the Navy. He said, well, son, uh, here's, here's the real story. You're going to finish high school. And since you're going to finish high school, you're going to take this exam that's given in December for NRTC scholarships. And uh, maybe you can get to college. And then you can go fly airplanes. Uh, that's what I did. Ended up in Miami University, a university before Florida was a state, as I remind all my friends in Orlando. And uh, off to flight training, and uh, that, that started the, the career. My goal was learn to fly an airplane, fly it as long as it's fun, get out and do something worthwhile, except Every year was more worthwhile than the year before. Every year was a little bit more fun, more challenges than the year before. And uh, lo and behold, 38 years passed by. So did jobs that I had never wanted to do. Thought, how in the world could anybody assign me to be this, in this job? And each one was better than the one before. So. The adventure is out there, but I can tell you, you don't know what the adventure is really going to be. But I'll tell you, you're going to have fun. You're going to learn. You're going to be able to educate others. You're going to be able to lead. And you'll serve this great nation. And I thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Moving on to Operation Desert Storm. History and the media tend to portray Operation Desert Storm as that quaint little war that was a video game war. It was a 100-hour war. Uh, nobody died. And I wanted you to please share your own experiences uh, to dispel, dispel that myth and to explain just what a big deal it was when, when you have over 600,000 people who are placed in theater, some of the things that you faced, and some of the very uncertain times, because uh, we all know that history has a way of lining things up very neatly and cleanly afterwards, but when you're in the middle of it, it's very, very uncertain. I just wanted to, to, to see if you all would mind uh, sharing some of your personal perspectives, what you went through in some of those uncertain and tense times. <laughs> Colonel Ray, we'll pick you oh, again. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, first off, uh, 
my experience is, I've, is more from the direct tactical level, so it's, a, uh, it's probably going to be far closer to what most of you will experience initially in, in a combat environment, for sure. I didn't, never had the, uh, what I consider the, ma the massive responsibility of these gentlemen right here, but at the same time, as it, um, in terms of responsibility for other people's lives, I mean, it, it do doesn't get any greater. Anytime you're responsible, it, you take on the responsibility of someone else, it, it doesn't matter whether it's one or 100,000, it's hugely important and it's personal. And uh, my, my experiences involved, involved some engagements, prior, prior uh, eight hour engagements where we, uh, we, we uh, executed some raids across the, uh, pretty, uh, across into what we considered to be the Iraqi territory at the time. And, uh, and then, then hustle back, but mostly to harass them, try to get a sense of, of uh, their will and uh, disrupt their, disrupt, disrupt, disrupt them some, but in fact to help execute these people, these folks, uh, this general's big plan of showing a, uh, showing a, an interest in, in uh, doing one thing when we really intended to do something else. So that's that plays into it. I, unfortunately, on a raid, ended up losing seven seven marine, good Marines. And on that on that night, after that night, that was the first time I had experienced some Marines getting killed. And and quite frankly, even to this day, it still I, I, it bothers me a, a whole lot. I um, I went through a a period where I was, in fact, ready to walk away. I figured that's it. I, I, I just can't take people dying. I just can't. And, and but at the same time, my the general that I work for, a guy by the name of General Myatt, I I'm sitting literally sitting on a on my gear, prepared prepared to walk in and let him know that I'm just it's time for me to go back home. And he looks at me and he's. He's a, um, a uh, Vietnam vet. He looks at me and he says, hey, this is, unfortunately, this is, the, this is the bad part of what you do. But remember, there's nothing you can do about the folks that got lost. You look over there. And I took a look, and there's about 150 young men, in my case, and with, and, it's, and it was kind of, it was an emotional moment for me because they were pretty, everybody had been up a couple, a couple days, their faces all dirty, and, and they're just, they're standing there. And uh, he says, they're the ones who need you now. And I looked over there, and it just put it all right back into perspective. Just put it right back because I'm not walking away. I wasn't walking away because I could. I was walking away because I couldn't for, couldn't deal with the people who had died. But, but what I was actually walking away from was the people who were living, the people who needed me. And I and I and at that point it changed, it changed my whole. There was, my change was that there would never be another moment, ever, where I would ever second guess my effort. If 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 anybody died from that from that moment on, as I remember at that time, I f and I'll tell you, I was so tired just before these guys that this happened, I actually said, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out, take a you know, take a Take a 20 minute nap, and I'm going to go, you know, get back to it. And this happened. And, and as God's my witness, it'll never happen again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm going to pass it on.
Right. I think the I think the passion and, and emotion you just heard from Eddie is witness to at least in land combat and the in the deadly arena that that's land combat. Uh, there's there's nothing easy about it. it. It's it's. I got to write a forward for a, a book about a company level action in in Desert Storm, and I, I learned this in Vietnam. And that the the people who do the real tough fighting get wounded or killed in action by the soldiers and small unit leaders. The non commissioned officers, the junior officers, always throughout our history in, in land warfare. So when uh, people say to me, the Seventh Corps and Desert Storm, well, it was only 89 hours, you know, 250 kilometers, that's pretty quick, that's pretty easy. I say, hey, wait a minute, you know, uh, let me explain a little bit about land combat. In a deadly arena that's land combat. People exchanging direct fire in land combat. I don't care where it is, in the jungle, desert. As we are reminded this week of two casualties in Afghanistan, Sergeant Gloyer, Captain Byers. Captain Byers was married to a Naval Academy graduate. And three casualties in Jordan announced yesterday, today. And so uh, I, I never equate swiftness with ease. After Desert Storm, when we were doing our after action reviews, I want to record some things for history books and so forth. Every after action review said that the success we had on Desert Storm was due to the courage and skill and selflessness and, yes, sacrifice of the soldiers and small unit leaders who took the fight to the enemy day and night, sandstorms, rain, all kinds of terrain conditions without let up and achieved their mission. And that's, that's why it's never easy. And it isn't today, and it won't be for all of you. And somebody asked me a few years ago, why, why should I be a soldier? And I, among other things, explained that if you're tough enough to meet those kind of standards and provide that kind of leadership, seems to me then you ought to, then you ought to be a soldier. And so, uh, my everlasting gratitude to the soldiers, small unit leaders in 7th Corps, American and British, as it turns out, since we had a British division as part of 7th Corps. You can go back and you can read the individual accounts of those small unit actions. We formed a Desert Storm Veteran Association so that each year we could hold a memorial service and read by name, one by one, the 111 of 7th Corps who died either during combat or, or from, other, from other causes. And so it's the skill and the courage and the no quit and the resilience, keep coming back, press the attack at the small unit level that always, always, Well, success in land combat, and it was like that in Desert Storm. And what, what more senior officers, which I was at that point in time, it seems to me our, our job was to see to it that you get them in the right place and the right combination and the right advantage over the, over the enemy you're fighting and, and keep them that way, and then, then they'll take it from there. And they'll take it from there in the great land, sea, and air team. Uh, that we had during Desert Storm. So I am um, forever grateful I was given the privilege to command 7th Corps. I 
I remember every day those soldiers and small unit leaders, the NCOs, officers, and soldiers who took the fight to the enemy day and night and in all kinds of weather to achieve the mission. And that's, that's where it seems to me that that, that uh, focus ought to continually be in, in whatever types of campaigns or, or actions uh, that we're involved in in the complex world we talk about today. And that will be your privilege to lead men and women like that. And for that, it seems to me, uh, we just do the very best we can to fulfill that trust of those who are entrusted to our leadership so we can achieve that mission at, at least cost to those who are entrusted to us. Well, I came in, in theater later than most. Uh, uh, I relieved the prior NAV-4 commander, who was also 7th Fleet, in December. So a lot of the planning and a lot of the forces had already uh, been sent or were going to be sent in theater. And my job prior to that was as a Navy logistician, so I had been heavily involved from back here in Washington of getting the stuff out into theater at the right time, the right places, and the right quantity. And so I knew a little bit about what the planning looked like, uh, but I wasn't privy to all the nits and grits. So when I showed up and we knew things were going to happen pretty fast, some of us thought it would happen before January. Some of us thought it would be a little bit later, which it was. But there's a couple of things that I think are really important. First of all, the leadership team at the time. All of us were Vietnam vets. All of us had our own beliefs about what we had been through in Vietnam and some of the mistakes that had been made and were pretty well committed to each other that we weren't going to allow that to happen for Desert Storm. That we were going to get rid of some of the craziness that went on during Vietnam. And that we were out there to win and we're going to win big and we weren't going to take a whole bunch of casualties. The problem was we were facing the world's fourth largest army supposedly having great capabilities and were combat tested. So none of us believed that it was going to be easy. And so an awful lot of time was spent making sure that the details were covered. And those details had to go across uh, the whole joint arena. So. Some of my responsibilities were to be a part of the air campaign with the six aircraft carriers, keep a reserve force of Marines at sea so we could either reinforce or conduct an amphibious landing, let the SEALs do the early recon to get in the beach and see what we were really going to face, and try to find out how we were going to deal with the mines. Because one of the things that we didn't worry too much about in Vietnam was, other than in the early days of thinking that they were mining some of the northern waters of the Tonkin Gulf, which they did, but nothing like what we saw in the Persian Gulf. Because uh, the mines, uh, they don't know. They don't know foe from friend. And uh, if you want to be where you ought to be to do the job that you're supposed to be, you need to be where they are. And so the, the big problem was how do you get there 
when we couldn't do the reconnaissance required to go up and actually sink them while they were doing it. We had two ships hit mines while we were there. Luckily, with no loss of life, lots of damage to the ships, but they were all able to make it back to port. Uh, the amphibious ship was able to stay on station for another four or five days to uh, help with the mine sweeping efforts until they could be, a relief ship could be brought in. So the details of the planning were important. The relationships between the commanders were important. And the fact that uh, we also spent an awful lot of time making sure that we didn't have the operational losses of our people that we had in the Vietnam War, where we lost as many people trying to get to combat than we lost in combat. And so uh, from that vantage point, I think we were very successful. Operationally, we lost very few people before the war. And the good training and the good leadership at the deck plate level made sure we didn't lose that many once we went to war. So that's sort of the picture from on high, what you're trying to look for, make sure that your people are aware of and that taking care of your people begins from day one. Gentlemen, I, I know that several of you were not in the room uh, before lunch, but um, it makes me feel really young when I hear that people were six years old when 9-11 happened. But uh, I think a lot, of, a lot of the cadets in the room probably take for granted the way that folks in uniform are looked upon and treated post 9-11. And Desert Storm has been basically categorized as a turning point in this country's history in terms of, of uh, making, uh, nothing makes up for it, but from overcoming those and healing some of those wounds that were left over from, from Vietnam. Uh, two of you were in uniform in, in Vietnam. Colonel Ray, I know that you were just after that. And if you want me to, to brag on you, I'll say way after that. But, <laughs> A couple of years after that, can you please talk to the, the, the difference in terms of how the public uh, has you know, perceived the military, your experiences between those different eras as a result of, of that turning point in Operation Desert Storm? Um, okay, I'd, first I'd, I was somewhat a witness of, of the, res, the response that the American public had for Vietnam veterans, more so, more so a witness as a as a uh, adolescent and older adolescent, probably, and um, and quite frankly, it's pretty shameful in my in my uh, estimation. And um, when I came into the Marine Corps, I came, actually came in in '77, and uh, and uh, there was there was within the service within the Marine Corps. As a as a uh, organization, you could tell when you essentially when you walked through the door, there was some there was a sense of of um, regret within the Marine Corps and especially people like me just coming in of how how the public actually treated Vietnam veterans, and uh, there was a special there was always a special place at least in in my in my heart and the way I felt about it was there is a, a, sub, a, a sense of reverence for, for the folks who actually served and were still serving. And, uh, and, and here I was coming in, you know, kind of a, kind of a slick sleeve, if you will, or a slick, a slick and uh, who didn't, uh, didn't have any, any background, any experience, any, and uh, these are the guys who, who really endured not just the the rigors of combat, but but also the the social the social pain that was uh, was thrown at them, and they still stood there and helped teach us. And so, no, there was a definite difference. In comparison 
coming back from Desert Storm, it just seemed, it seemed like, you know, as, hey, you know, the public was appreciative, you know, big parades and everything. But, but I, I'll tell you, honestly, there was a little bit of guilt there for me because you know, everywhere you went, you know, everybody had a local parade or a parade there and parade here and big parades, little parades, and, you know, every, everywhere there was, a, there was a parade coming for people coming back from uh, the storm and, and, that, and that was fine. But I honestly felt like it was just, you know, almost like the survivor's guilt. You know, that society was just too ready to pour it on so much to make up for what, what happened after Vietnam. That's just me. So, and I'm always good for giving you my opinion. So, <laughs> so, so. Uh, any other Vietnam veterans in the, in the room here? Yeah, great. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, my own sensing and my own circles are Valley Ford General Hospital was that that quite simply trust was fractured here in America between those who went and did what our country asked at great cost to themselves and in, in that generation. They did it with, with great skill. The unit I was with, 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, uh, with great courage, uh, great selflessness, looking out for each other, great pride in their unit. But there was trust fractured between them and our military and civilian leadership, and really the rest of the country. And so uh, the, the climate just uh, was that they'd gone and done that all for, for nothing. It didn't matter. It was a waste. And that, that's certainly not what at least the wounded warriors I was around, that, that's not what anybody really wanted to hear. And so those those of us who continue to serve and those who didn't, who were, were out in other walks of life, I think collectively, I think as Stan said earlier, determined that we need to rebuild that trust. We need to rekindle that trust so that if we ever do this again, there's, there's that trust united between uh, those who go and do what our country asks and our military and civilian leadership and the American people. And I recall after the parade over here that was done on, in early June of 1991 on Independence Avenue, uh, the, the first place my wife and I wanted to go was over to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial and go visit with those that I had served with, her cousins on that wall, my operations uh, NCO who mentored me as a young major going to Vietnam, was killed in action on his fifth tour in, in Vietnam. Wanted to go over there and visited with some Vietnam veterans and I said, you know, this one was for you too. And their immediate response to me was, thanks. We felt better today than we have in a long time. And uh, for, for me, anyway, that was, that was trust reunited. And I think in a larger sense in America that those who served in Desert Storm, the land, sea, and air forces that won that victory as a coalition to liberate Kuwait helped in America to reunite that trust. And so the, the outpouring of our fellow citizens, as we see today with this generation, this post 9-11 generation, I personally like to call the, the next greatest generation for her own no quit deployment after deployment, 
in this war in Iraq and Afghanistan, staying at it with all kinds of decisions on force levels and combat, no combat, advise and assist, and no combat, all of that, staying after it and doing the best they can. And a great personal sacrifice and cost to this generation and their families. And I like to call this post 9-11 generation now 15 years into, into these two wars, the next greatest generation. But the, the sense of trust between those who go and do that, all of you and the American people seem solid now, which is a wonderful thing to see. And I think we saw the awakenings of that uh, following the results on Desert Shield and Desert Storm. And I personally, uh, very humbled and gratified to, to see that and to be a, a small part of that, along with my whole generation that had seen it another way, a generation before. So I, I, I personally just feel very humbled and grateful to have had that opportunity uh, in Desert Shield and, and Desert Storm. Uh, <clears throat> I was a commanding officer of uh, an A-4 squadron in the 72 uh, for nine months from January. Uh, for nine months we were deployed. Uh, and at the time, we were flying the most missions in the Vietnam that we'd ever flown during the war. Uh, ended up uh, completing over 500 missions on that tour. Uh, when I left the squadron, I was ordered back here to Washington to the Industrial College of the Armed Forces. I was proud of what I'd been doing. I was extremely proud of my squadron. We went through some of the heaviest of the air campaign in 72. We didn't lose a single airplane or a pilot. Every other squadron in the air wing did, some of them multiple times, some of them very close friends of mine. I was feeling pretty good. I thought we'd done really good. And I come back to Washington, D.C., and I'm told, you may not wear your uniform. You are not permitted to wear your uniform here in town. That was the message. I was crushed. I thought, what in the world is going on? So we go, we talk about Desert Storm and what we decided to, we wouldn't let happen. And <clears throat> since I was dual-hatted in my role, uh, I had another job to do as, sort of, as soon as Desert Storm was over, and that was be the Seventh Fleet Commander. So I was staying in theater and going to do the Seventh Fleet Commander role. And, tour around the wide Pacific and the Indian Ocean, making port visits and making friends and doing lots of exercises and stuff like this. And they're going to have this grand parade in Washington, D.C. And I said, uh, I'm not going back for that. I've done this before. I'm not going to go back to Washington. And, uh, we've done our thing out here, either people think we did well or they don't think we did well, but I'm not going to subject myself to that event again. Well, I got orders. Uh, you will leave the flagship. You will come back, and you will march in the parade in D.C., and you will march in the parade in New York City. But it's interesting to hear what Fred had to say about the wall. After the march, the day of the march here in D.C., I said, OK, I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to go over to the wall. It was tough. 
but it was it was the right thing to do. Made peace, and uh, I'm so thankful that they made me come back and do that. Does anybody happen to have any questions for the gentleman up here? Okay, just right here in the center. <coughs> right here in the center. He's got the. Cadet Hightower, United States Air Force Academy. Gentlemen, this is for uh, any of you. I think Gulf War is one of the best examples of coalition ops. Uh, could you talk about anyone you're particularly impressed with in terms of other countries, other forces that you worked with? Uh, I, I can tell you firsthand, I, I was, uh, and I, I have to apologize to West Point cadets here. I was just up there on Tuesday night and spoke in a dining hall, so they're probably hearing some of this for the second time. But repetition, not too bad, so, so sorry, sorry about that if you've heard some of this before. Good, good, to, see all, good to see all of you. Uh, I was privileged uh, in December of uh, 1990, we were, Seventh Corps, we were assigned the 1st British Armor Division, placed under tactical control of the of 7th U.S. Corps, and so I got a chance to work very, very closely with the, with the British. And, uh, they were terrific allies. Uh, we both spoke English, but our professional language was a little different here and there, so we had to straighten some of that out. Uh, our staffs were different sizes, and but down at the small unit level, as I mentioned earlier, they were tough and well-trained and aggressive, uh, just like our tankers and infantry and artillery uh, troops were, and uh, accepted missions, uh, did rehearsals like uh, we had. I mean, the British division at that time with, with uh, attachments was about 23,000. Uh, our own divisions were about that same size. We ended up with about 146,000 American British soldiers in, in the 7th Corps. And, uh, about 1,600 tanks, and it was a sizable operation with all kinds of support from the air, and anything we needed from, from Navy air, from, I mean, as much as we needed wherever we wanted it. Uh, but the British were, uh, were great allies. They were, as they remain today, uh, great friends. Uh, we, we stay in contact with them. The 111 names we read at our memorial service includes uh, our British comrades who died during, during desert, Shield Desert Storm. Uh, we, we did a lot of training ahead of time, but, but uh, couldn't have asked for, for anything more from them. Our, uh, to our east was an Egyptian Corps, two divisions commanded by uh, an officer who went on to become the, essentially the equivalent of the chairman of their Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, and we exchanged plans and uh, I recall uh, the, the Egyptian commander uh, put their operations map up. I mean, it was a work of art. It was just on all kinds of different colors and drawings very precise. And, and he said, uh, don't, don't worry about that. We're not that rigid, but we've all been to the Soviet staff <laughs> schools, and that's, that's the way they draw up their graphics. So we had a lot of great exchanges with, uh, with Egyptians to include uh, some help to them with aviation and so forth, or artillery. So uh, I think if you, uh, uh, the, the key to that I, I came away with is that uh, you, you want to incorporate, you want to make them feel part of the team, you want to go over and visit with them, let them see you, have them uh, come over and see your organization, do as much uh, familiarization as you can, do as much training together 
as you can ahead of time, gain confidence, give them missions that are in accordance with their own uh, capacities and, and capabilities so they can be successful. I mean, they wanted to be successful in the operation just like we did, so they could have their, their own uh, pride back home just like we wanted back here in the United States. So we, we didn't want to you know, reach for permissions for them that perhaps they, they wouldn't be capable of. And, and so uh, I, my experiences with, uh, with them was uh, terrific. After, the, after combat, and uh, we had a French unit who was uh, out on our west, it was assigned operationally to us to remain in Iraq until the UN Security Council resolution was passed. And I remember going out to the French commander. I said, uh, when are you going home? And he looked me straight in the eye and said, we'll go home when you go home. So I thought that was, that was pretty terrific. Uh, so they were great allies, got to visit both places, both Britain and France, after the war, as well as Egypt. And uh, the camaraderie you feel during operations like that was still present in all those, all those three visits. So I, my experience was not unlike the current generation in, in working with uh, allies in Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, and with other countries. So it was, it was all, po all positive. From, from for me in Seventh Corps with the, with the British and with the with the French and, and with the Egyptians. Folks, I'm sorry, I'm getting the hook here. Did you have something you want to say? Well, I just just a, a quick snippet. When I got in theater, I decided I'd visit all the ships to see you know anybody had any problems, anything that they needed that we didn't hadn't provided, and uh, the British commodore invited me over to his flagship early on in my rounds, and I went over, and <clears throat> of course, they were fresh from learning what had gone right and what had gone wrong down in the Falklands. And uh, they were ready for war. I mean, we were, we were out there like we were ready to do whatever we were tasked to do, but I mean, they were ready for war. All the mirrors had tape on them. They had sent their presentation silver back home to be in a museum so that if they got sunk, the presentation silver wouldn't get lost. Uh, they had no mech suits for everybody on the ship when they were at GQ. I mean, I went back to, the, to our guys and said, hey, We've we've got to step the pace up a little bit. We're not we're not near as ready as these guys. So there was some good stuff coming back from our our friends. <laughs>